and all. Uh, my name is Vivek Anandan, and I work as a manager with Agri Consulting Team with IntelliCap. On behalf of Avishkar Group and the entire team within IntelliCap, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our distinguished speakers and all the participants to the session on recent agri reforms in India. As many of you are aware, the Government of India has recently legislated three acts related to agri marketing. These acts are directed towards increasing private sector participation in the agri food supply chain. These laws have relaxed the erstwhile restriction over private sector players on direct engagement with farmers. They have also relaxed the stocking limits of certain agriculture commodities. And further, there is now a new legislation for private sector players to enter into contract farming arrangements with farmers. Along with this new set of rules, Government of India has also set up Agriculture Infrastructure Fund to provide medium to long term low cost debt to finance post harvest infrastructure development in the country. The Agriculture Infrastructure Fund is set to disperse loans to the total value of 1 lakh crores, which is about 13.35 billion US dollars in the next 10 years. The government has also dedicated 5,000 crores, which is about 669 million US dollars, to develop FPOs in the country. This includes formation of 10,000 new FPOs in the next three years. All these measures by government has created a new backdrop, not only for private sector players, but also for different stakeholders operating in the agriculture ecosystem. In this context, we have invited panelists representing different stakeholders to share their insights on some of the key aspects of the emerging agriculture landscape in the country. Let me give a brief introduction of our distinguished panelists for this session today. Our first panelist brings in on-ground perspective of smallholder farming and farmer collectivization. We welcome Ms. Madhu Ketan, Program Director of Pradhan. Pradhan is a renowned Indian NGO working in the Central India Tribal Belt, predominantly on right-based approach to livelihood development. Ms. Ketan is a management graduate who chose rural development as a vocation. She has been working with Pradhan for the past 28 years, and she comes with a rich on-field implementation experience. She is recognized for her work on institution building and farm-based livelihoods. She has been involved in influencing Pradhan's agriculture approach towards market-oriented production strategy. She, this approach has been rapidly scaled up in Pradhan, leading to establishment of block-level production clusters involving several lakh farmers around production of high-value crops such as vegetables, fruits, and flowers. Our second panelist brings in on-ground perspective of FPO formation and FPO development within key agri-value chains. We welcome Mr. Ashish Mondal, the founding director of Action for Social Advancement, shortly called as ASA, an Indian NGO which works in over 2,000 villages of India, primarily on farm-based livelihoods development for smallholders. Mr. Mondal is a postgraduate in development studies and development management from the University of East Anglia, UK. He was a member of National Advisory Council an advisory body to Prime Minister of India during 2012-14. He is a current member of National Advisory Committee of the Product Producer Organization Fund created by NABAR. He also serves as an independent director in the board of NAPKISAN, a subsidiary of NABAR, since 2015. Besides, he has served in other national and international committees related to smallholder agriculture. Mr. Mondal is a known name and a pioneer when it comes to FPO movement in the country. Our third panelist brings in agri-entrepreneurship perspective of FPO aggregation as well as providing agri-input and agri-output services to farmers through FPOs. We welcome Mr. Rajiv Kaimal, the co-founder and managing director of PayAgri Innovations Private Limited, an impact agri startup with a physical digital hybrid model. He was earlier the founding member and head business and partnerships for Samnati Financial Services Private Limited, which is an agri-value chain financing company. In the past, he has worked as a head Strategy and Alliance for IFMR Rural Channels, as well as Head of Micro Banking Project for Citibank Mumbai. He has over 18 years of experience in banking and financial industry. He specializes in the field of business, rural strategy, agri-value chain, and rural financial services. Our fourth panelist brings in the perspective of building e-marketplace for agri-commodities, as well as enabling commodity trade. We welcome Mr. Rajesh Sinha, thought leader in agri-commodity markets, financial markets, agri-tech, food and agri-businesses. Until September 2020, Mr. Sinha was the Managing Director and CEO of NCDX eMarkets Limited, shortly called as NEML. He, he was also a Director with Rashtriya eMarkets and Services Limited. He is also one of the current Director with Agriculture Skill Council of India. 
Under his leadership, NEML Limited grew from a 10-member organization in 2008 to a sustainable corporate today. Some of the pioneering work done by NEML under his leadership include creation of a state agriculture market in Karnataka that was later adapted by central government as E-National Agriculture Market, which is shortly called ENA. Under his leadership, NEML also partnered with SFAC to directly procure from farmer producer organization under the price support schemes. So we have four panelists today, distinguished panelists. We thank each and every uh, one of them for agreeing to come on board as a panelist for this session today. To moderate this panel, we are privileged to have with us Mr. Manivanan Pati, Senior Agriculture Specialist, Agriculture and Food Global Practice within World Bank. Mr. Pati has been associated with World Bank for over 14 years. He manages policy dialogue, project development, and project implementation along with key partnerships. He has delivered several projects which had a high impact on policy making. This includes the widely cited Maharashtra Agriculture Competitiveness Project, which had guided many policy formulation with respects to institution building and development of alternative marketing options. He is currently leading World Bank funded agribusiness reform programs in several Indian states. And he is also involved in the adoption of progressive laws and regulations and supporting development of new regulatory institutions. Prior to joining World Bank, Mr. Pati was with the private sector for over 12 years. In his last assignment, he was with Tata Chemicals, where he was leading the company's foray into agribusiness sector. We are thankful to our moderator to join us and agreeing to moderate this session. Without taking any further time, let me pass on the mic to Mr. Manivanan Pati to take over the proceedings. Over to you, Mr. Pati. Thank you, Vivekanandan. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this important topic on recent agri-marketing reforms and its impact on farmers, farmer producer organizations, and the agri-startups. We have a distinguished panel today. The panelists bring some varied and relevant experiences to this discussion. Their experience includes integrating smallholder farmers into organized value chains, building the FPO network in central India, tech enabled access to finance to producers and enterprises, and the pioneering work in the field of virtual markets. We'll be greatly benefited from their experiences and knowledge. As a context, the recent reforms are considered to be beneficial to the farmers and is considered as a step towards doubling farmers' income. The government, along with these reforms, have introduced several enabling initiatives, which is meant to support the farmers and farmer produce organization to transition to this liberalized marketing ecosystem. As Vivekananda described in the introduction, the enabling ecosystem includes the $14 billion Agri Infrastructure Fund, which is meant to provide long-term financing to the critical near-farm post-service infrastructure and the FPO program that is supporting the formation of 10,000 FPOs in the next few years. Apart from these, we understand that work is underway to provide enhanced market information and intelligence system to the farmers and FPOs. There are also plans to reorient the ENAM, including a horizontal expansion of this platform. This work underway to enhance the agrologistic network in the country and also increasing the use of risk mitigation measures. In all these initiatives, the government is welcoming an active participation of FPOs, agri startups, small and medium enterprises, processors, exporters, and agribusiness companies. We are also aware that prior to these market reforms, the government had initiated work in the land tenancy as well. The objective is to bring tenant farmers into formal ecosystem. This will enable the tenant farmers to access many of the government programs which they have been denied thus far. So these market reforms will need to be seen in the context of various initiatives taken by the government of India or plan to be rolled out soon by the government in building a robust ecosystem that can benefit the farmer, the farmer producer organization, 
and the agri startups. With this brief context setting, let me turn over to the first panel member, Ms. Madhu Ketan, who will capture the impact of these reforms and the initiatives on the income of the smallholder farmers. Over to Madhuji. Sorry, thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, Mani. And uh, also thanks, Vivek, uh, uh, for uh, participation in this uh, panel. I'd like to uh, share my uh, experience of, uh, uh, of having worked uh, with smallholder farmers in Pradhan over the last uh, uh, close to 30 years. Um, so we work with around close to 8 lakh uh, uh, women which are organized uh, into uh, SHGs and then we work with them on various uh, livelihood uh, enhancement interventions and primary uh, uh, the prominent among them which is uh, uh, agriculture. So I let me my my starting proposition is that you know i think there is a strong role of uh, markets in improving farmer incomes but i think for smallholder farmers pursuing subsistence cultivation for own consumption for this set of farmers i think currently markets in its current form have a limited role to play in improving their incomes so I'll tell you why I say this. Uh, we work in seven states of the country huh, where there's pervasive poverty. In these areas, most households still have a land holding size of one to two hectares. But despite that, I mean, uh, uh, green revolution is, you know, largely bypassed these areas. So farmers produce for their own consumption, traditional crops, and they sell in small quantities in the weekly heart to meet their household needs, huh? things like spices, namak, etc., oil, etc. These farmers do not go to the mandi. Huh? They sell to the nearest trader with whom they generally have a long-standing relationship of purchase and sale. So, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, mandi prices, uh, I mean, mandi prices do of course act as a benchmark or as reference point for uh, the prices which are offered by uh, traders in the area, that is definitely true. But the small surplus that these farmers um, have makes the potential for significant income enhancement through interaction with agriculture markets of limited importance. That's what I would like to say. And, uh, you know, so what is the alternative? I mean, not alternative, what else is uh, required? Let me put it this way. So it is my proposition that what is required are game-changing solutions for smallholder farmers. Basically, I mean, along with the market reforms, these are very welcome, but along with the market reforms, we also need production reforms at the level of smallholder farmers. So I'm talking about things like irrigation. I'm talking about things like, you know, polyhouses, trellis farming, etc which enables the transition from farmers growing age-old traditional crops uh, to switch to low water guzzling but higher value crops like fruits, vegetables, flowers, new age crops. Huh? Um, so with the announcement of the Agriculture Infrastructure Fund and coupled with changes also in the Contract Farming Act, it does create potentially, you know, ground for missing infrastructure to be created like go-downs, cold storage, market yards, and other logistical services to come up in the vicinity of smallholder farmers. But this also needs to be combined with some, you know, uh, 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 also investments which kind of make it possible also for farmers to transit to uh, uh, these kinds of high value crops, thus making the two together, I'm, I'm saying, will make it possible for farmers to shift from paddy wheat based farming to growing high value crops without having to depend on external development interventions like, you know, like ours to take this plunge. I'll, I'll stop here. 
Thank you, Madhuji. This is excellent points what you're making. It's not only the uh, market side intervention, which is important, but also um, greater in, um, uh, intervention, which is needed on the production side as well. So both part of the value chain, which needs um, intervention, which is important. So uh, with this um, um, uh, thoughts, uh, let me uh, then turn over to um, uh, Mr. Ashish Mondel, who will focus on the FPO linkage with uh, government agencies and private sector, and also address some of the issues which Madhuji had uh, flagged off in her um, initial observation. Hi. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, hear me? Yes, Ashish. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mani, and thank you, Vivek, and all other colleagues from the Intellicap uh, and my co-panelists. Uh, well, I think, you know, I mean, I would uh, I would like to echo what just Madhu has said about uh, this, uh, the, the, the investment in the production system development. Uh, that is a kind of a, kind of a prerequisite if you want to, um, you know, uh, to build a kind of a robust uh, uh, small farmers agri system. Uh, along with the production system investment, I mean, if you know, I mean, you as you know very well that uh, for a long time, uh, there is a kind of a investment deficit that is going on and largely not only for the marketing infrastructure, but also for the production infrastructure in terms of electricity, irrigation, land development, plantation of trees, all of these things have been uh, kind of a kind of a sluggishness that we have been observing for, for, for some time, almost two decades now. Uh, these areas are very cr cr crucial areas for, for the smallholders. And I think, you know, there is, there should be some amount of investment must go in that direction. That is number one. Besides, just to add another point on the production system, we haven't haven't also done much of an investment in our R&D. R&D in terms of our seed development, R&D in terms of our, uh, our, our package of practice development. I mean, we talk about, uh, talk a lot about the, the you know, market laid uh, production system development. The market is now looking for good quality food with less of pesticides, less of chemical fertilizers. But you ask our agriculture universities, none of them have come out with the kind of a you know, standard package of practices, recommended package of practices for, for organic cultivation, or we don't even know that, you know, what is exactly the, the recommendation for organic cultivation. So we haven't done much of the R&D in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, this agriculture package of practices. So that area also requires, our agriculture universities are suffering from, from uh, kind of a fund and all. Now coming to the third point about the, the, the how APOs are going to take the advantage of this emerging situation. Look, I mean, this is a, this is a known fact that, you know, the, the smallholders, they need to be aggregated to, to, to you know, uh, do the marketing. And then APOs for that matter is, is a fantastic instrument. Uh, you know, I mean, we have tried that. I mean, it is not that APO is the, all of a sudden is a new concept. We have been doing it through the farmers cooperative, but unfortunately that had gone into a different direction. Now, the how APOs can uh, tie up with this uh, or, or taking the, the advantage of the current situation, uh, A, that uh, this investment by the government, proposed investment by the government for the APO development is very welcoming. We are also hearing that uh, the, the, you know, the corporates will be now asked to, to connect with the farmers directly through the conduit of the APOs, which is, again, if it happens, it's a fantastic uh, initiative. Uh, but at the same time, we also, uh, the, the government also need to look at the areas of that if APOs have to be made competitive or they are kind of, you know, a, a, a good stake in the supply chain, um, then they need um, a very longer term support. These institutions will not start, you know, functioning on their own unless we have created a, a support ecosystem to, to pull these institutions up and, you know, I mean, make them stand in the, in the marketplace. Although I'm very happy uh, that, you know, this investment for the 10,000 APUs is coming, but not much at the moment in terms of creating the support ecosystem. I mean, I, I always take the, uh, take the reference of the, the NDDB and the AMUL. 
Amul is there because NDDP supported it and they have been still doing it, right? And that is something that we need to create, that kind of support ecosystem at the national and state and even, even a lower level uh, to, to, to kind of support these FPOs. And that is a kind of a must. Um, yeah, I would like to stop here at this point in time. So three points that we need to continue with our investment in the production system development. We need to make more investment in the R&D and also create a support ecosystem alongside APA promotion investment. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah. All, Thank you. Yeah. All excellent points. All excellent points. In fact, so from, for uh, participants who have just joined in, Ashish is in a uh, in an area where the onions are currently stored and oh, yeah. also marketing yeah. these onions, right? So he's in the field and um, and he's he's he has been in the trenches for many years. So all the points are very valid points, um, uh, and um, probably we'll consolidate it as we can get into the to the, uh, to the uh, before going to the next session. So with this uh, set of comments, uh, let me turn to. Um, Mr. Rajesh Shinha, who's been in the um, uh, in the marketing uh, of um, uh, in the virtual marketing uh, sphere, the innovations in that sphere for many many years, and um, here is um, uh, perspective on how do we um, uh, link the FPOs with the emerging e markets and the agri market space. Over to you, Mr. Sinha. Rajesh, we are not able to hear you. Are you still? So you're on mute. Rajesh, so you're on mute. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mani, Vivekananda, and entire IntelliCap team, uh, and the Sankal team for giving this opportunity. Now, I think the points have already been made. So I have just a few points. Like when we started for the first time that FPOs could be used for procurement, that was way back in 2013 to 2015, crop seasons. Uh, one of the things we found that there was no, uh, even bank accounts were not open. So in the five states we worked out, we actually went meticulously along with the banker so that a banker could actually be present in that village collection center, open the accounts, and that time there was a drive to open bank accounts. It helped. It was a mutual piece. All the way to finding a warehouse and the transportation uh, network, logistics, finding a finance against the goods stored in the warehouse. And uh, SFSE got the pledge finance from Corporation Bank for it. And that was the first time ever that FP was used in procurement. Fast forward it today, what we are looking at it is uh, that we have entire uh, government behind it. Now, one of the key pieces that was made by my previous uh, co-panelist was that there should be continuous support. So government bringing the desired reforms has possibly already paved out a way that in case you want things from FPOs, I would call it a farmer aggregate. FPO is a general term where you include farmer producer companies, uh, you have cooperatives, you can have joint liability groups and a host of them. Okay, So government has already paved the way, so we need industry to come forward and co-opt it because uh, purely based on government support, there is hardly anything that you can say that just because government is supporting FPOs would survive, that would be a sore point, I would say, in the long run. So what point Madhu made, that it's extremely important for us to look at what are those new pieces and can uh, corporate co-opt it. So that's number one. Number two, our experience uh, in NAML with NAFED. Uh, when we went to procurement, we made procurement a little more efficient. So you have to look at each of these points so that when you're going to procure, there has to be efficiency. MSP is good, you know, and these farm ordinances paves way for that. But look at this irony of onion. A few days ago, it was above 80 rupees. And if you look at the wholesale prices today, as we speak, it's down in the dumps today. You know, it's less than 20 rupees a kg in some of the markets. So that's the boom bust uh, life we are living in the markets. So when we look at market, markets as a tool for enhancing farmers' income, has largely been ignored. Even in the current act, they are welcome steps, but they fail to differentiate between e-trading and e-markets. So e-trade, anyone can do a e-trade. You have a computer, you have a virtual account. We Most of us do that e-trade. 
But to say that e trade is same as e market is extremely different. It is two very very different things. So when we looked at creating markets, we are looking at a self-regulated organization, which is which is bound by rules and uh, regulations which are known for everyone. So you have general terms and condition uh, which is known to everyone. As against it, e trading is more or less individual. So I would like to make this as a point that we go ahead and at least frame rules for e markets. That's second. Third, as we go forward, what we have realized being in the marketplace and prior to coming to a exchange world. Uh, I used to work for NGOs and also have worked as a purchase person for corporates, uh, for agri commodities. Uh, what is extremely important is that when we are looking at uh, these markets, we should avoid conflict of interest or concentration of risk. This has now become almost like you know every other person is having an app today. Making app is very easy. Connecting, you have an idea, put it together, and idea may not be very different than you know extracting value for oneself or one new entity in the entire set of value chain right from seed. I would say go to the soil, even you know soil interventions are required all the way till uh, seed goes back into the soil again. So from, so what is important is whether are you a market functionary function means if you are a buyer or a seller or a service provider in warehousing or transportation then you have a serious conflict of interest or a serious concentration of risk because your returns may be linear and risk may be geometric so if i am a warehouse man i have stored the goods i, have, I also have an entity which buys for it and i also have an entity that run a virtual platform if one lot goes away for whatever reasons, it's three times that loss, and money would be making would be in hardly certain basis point. So I think as policymakers and as we go forward, it's an extremely important step to differentiate between e market and e trading. Third, government on its own is not enough, and nor is the uh, desire to seek support. FPOs like any other is an aggregate, and an aggregate will be there as long as that aggregation is competitive just because there is an fpo and some members have contributed to become a fpo it does not make binding on the farmer to bring the or sell, buy or sell the produce through fpos fpos will have to be competitive and it's not on the numbers but on the quality of fpo that should be the focus obviously numbers are required we are far far short than what is required so it's a welcome step of what we are doing and the last point regarding a uh, model like Amul, I would also like to cite example of uh, eggs, that's poultry revolution, which is less sung about, but that's again has been, has made a tremendous impact. Amul is Amul because of Amul, not because of NDDB. NDDB came later on. And today also, Amul possibly is far, far ahead of many entities. So you created an NDDB to propagate how Amul was successful, those principles of three layer, aggregating, making village efficient, let them do what they do. You collect their goods, do a quality testing, pay off, then aggregate, put it to a district level processing cooperative, that is the village to a district level production. And then you create an APX brand in Amul at the top. Whatever you can sell at the local point, you sell it and rest, then you, then you can't be creating too many brands. So I would really caution most of us here who really believe that we can create brand. No one can take that right away, okay? But there has to be that kind of a 25 or 50 year sense of planning. And that's about it. And then maybe, you know, as we go forward, we can talk about it, uh, talk more, more points as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Always impressive comments on the current status of affairs and the most welcome. So with this, let me then move over to uh, Mr. Uh, Rajiv Kaimal, uh, who's uh, heading a startup. And um, uh, let us hear his perspective in terms of how do we bring in access to finance to uh, uh, the and uh, linkage of uh, agri startups with the FPO ecosystem. Over yeah. to you, Rajiv. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Manivanan, and uh, good morning to all. Um, so the uh, the agri reforms, uh, you know, what the government has announced is definitely a welcome initiative, uh, not only for the farmer, uh, but also I would say for the, uh, you know, the various agri value chain players, uh, whether it be supply chain management company or, uh, you know, warehouse management companies or even startups like us. 
right? See, from a startup perspective, uh, if you look at it, you know, what does a startup need to do its business activities? Uh, a conducive atmosphere, uh, a vibrant economy, and definitely a positive policy framework, right? So from that perspective, the agri reforms would definitely help uh, startups, which is in the agriculture sector. More importantly, the one focusing on the market leakage space, because with the uh, abolition of the uh, the APMC Mondays, now it becomes much more easier for startups like us to kind of you know directly deal with uh, uh, farmers and farmer producer organizations in different corners of the country. I would like to kind of share my experience, uh, you know, when we tried to do a similar transaction prior to the reform, right? We wanted to kind of procure lemon from a uh, from a particular farmer producer organization, in Andhra. Uh, the challenge was that, you know, the FPO said, uh, we will not be able to directly supply to you. You will have to take it from the Monday. So then I was like, if I have to take it from the Monday, then why do I need to deal with an FPO? Because in my whole model, the idea is to kind of, you know, deal with a farmer producer organization, pay them that whatever extra... Uh, you know, uh, money that they can pay and benefit the farmers, right? Now, with this abolition of the Mondays, now it becomes much more easier. In fact, after the reform coming in, I was having a chat with the uh, with the CEO of the FPO, and he was quite happy that, you know, now we don't have the janjar of, you know, going through the Mondays. So, so, uh, so this is definitely a welcome move, but at the same time, you know, it is little too early to kind of say whether, uh, to what extent the reforms can help, um, you know, the smallholder farmers, especially. Um, uh, you know, the caveat here is, you know, as like what the critics say, uh, with this, uh, you know, reforms, will the private sector or the corporate, uh, you know, become the, the next middleman, right? Uh, so that threat is always there. And I think that's where probably, uh, you know, the government should look at um, bringing some kind of a regulator uh, in place, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe something like a SEBI, which ensures that, you know, there is fairness and transparency in the transaction, whatever happens. And there are no monopolies, uh, you know, uh, getting set up. So, so that is uh, the only, uh, you know, thought that I have to kind of, uh, you know. But yeah, from a startup perspective, this is definitely a, a welcome move, and we are really looking forward to it. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, a great um, uh, observation. So, uh, we have um, all the four panelists have given their initial set of thoughts. Uh, I'll take a couple of minutes to kind of uh, sum up some of the important message which our panelists have given. I think I uh, was starting from if you were to look at the way in which the value chains have been organized, right from the production part of it. So um, both uh, Madhu as well as uh, Ashish um, uh, is um, putting the importance on what, what has been kind of missing out for quite some time now, which is the uh, investment which is needed at the, at the production level. That's number one where we can actually improve the productivity um, of the uh, many of the smallholder farmers. How do we, um, uh, for that to happen, we need increased investments in R&D, uh, university should, should uh, and the, uh, the surrounding uh, the research ecosystem should start focusing on um, uh, how the market-led extension can actually perform at the field level, right? So this will uh, need uh, revamping of the agriculture extension as well. Um, it's not only the uh, the uh, the private sector extension which is in the, which which needs to be revamped, but also the the public sector extension which needs to be uh, uh, revamped. Um, uh, important point so that it's not only uh, we are impacting the market end of the value chain, but we also need to ensure that the smallholder farmers are um, able to participate in the uh, in this uh, new ecosystem productively by improving the productivity uh, and uh, growing as per the market needs. The other point which um, um, I think it was the point which was made by um, uh, Ashish as well as by Rajesh on the uh, providing long-term um, support to FPOs, which essentially means that uh, it's not only um, it's important to um, have this program of um, 10,000 FPOs, which itself is a big step by um, on it itself, but then there's a greater need to ensure that these FPOs can become sustainable, uh, they can stand on their own uh, feet, and they can become competitive and actually work with the market in an efficient way. We have seen the recent reports where, uh, I think it was Aziz um, uh, uh, G Institute, which came out with a comprehensive report on what is the status of the FPO ecosystem in the country, while there are many, many positives which, uh, which is coming in, one of the uh, issues which has been flagged off consistently by such reports 
and many of the commentators is that how do we ensure the FPOs can be sustainably um, uh, supported and they can uh, sustain themselves beyond the typical mission mode approach which we take. Um, uh, uh, valid point, um, Ashish. So, the, I mean, the, how to do it? Uh, many options. One option is can we do uh, the kind of an NDDB kind of support which um, uh, NDDB has been doing on the formal milk uh, uh, value chain uh, uh, sector. Are there other options? There are quite a few other options which are emerging. Uh, and one of the points which uh, Rajesh Ji has pointed out is how do we co-opt private sector in ensuring that these FQs can actually sustain uh, beyond the typical mission mode of one example which I want to uh, share with the team, this is happening in Uttarakhand where um, uh, a joint stock company has been established between the private sector and an FPO and with a very um, a clear timeline where the, the private sector will exit after four years of handholding the uh, FPO's own capacity and building the capacity of the board of directors of the FPO as well. So that such models are also emerging. We also seeing emerging models where uh, corporate sector is working with the uh, FPOs on a franchisee business model. So at this point, what Rajesh is saying in terms of co-opting um, corporate sector is important so that uh, government and some intervention can go thus far. But beyond that, market will have to find solutions and processes by which uh, these institutions can uh, sustain beyond the typical mission mode approach. So um, Rajesh Ji also made a very important point, uh, I think, uh, which is co coming out very clearly, uh, is the, the differentiation between the e-trading and the uh, e-marketing. Um, so um, many of you have uh, gone through the, uh, the, um, the farm bills uh, where there's an option for e-trading, but then the, it is not very clear how the e-market is supposed to emerge. There's a conflict of interest provision as well as um, for the first time I'm hear, hearing this. There's a concentration of risk, nicely put, uh, where one entity um, um, is um, spanning across multiple um, points in the value chain, right? You, you're seeing that kind of models emerging in the country, but how do we ensure that the conflict of interest um, um, provisions can be avoided in terms of these uh, kind of uh, situations? Important point made by the Rajesh. So, the last point what uh, Rajesh is making is it's an important point. If you on a standalone basis, it's very difficult to sustain unless they become competitive, become efficient, and able to negotiate with the, uh, with the market. You can, you can um, uh, see that if you are participating in a big way in the, uh, in the procurement operation, especially in the pulses uh, sector and the oil seed sector, but more and more what is needed is we need to ensure that these uh, FPOs can establish long-term partnership with the uh, with the private sector, be it an um, startups, be it an um, um, SME and enterprises or a processor or an exporter or in a large uh, agribusiness companies. Only then we can say that the FPO, the FPO and the, um, uh, the private sector can um, uh, succeed, uh, bring in value to both, in, um, both the partners by do, uh, doing that. The last point what uh, Mr. Um, uh, Kaimal Rajiv was making is, uh, is an important point. How uh, the, uh, the, the, the new law has enabled the FPOs to work, um, the startups to work directly with the FPOs. A good example how um, uh, disintermediation of value chains can happen. Uh, the onion example is a great example, um, Rajiv. Uh, while um, the overall agri start startup ecosystem is um, uh, emerging in the country, we are also seeing uh, most of these agri startups in the uh, output, um, in the input um, uh, side of the value chain. We are seeing um, uh, emergence of the output uh, end of the value chain as well as they go ahead. And the important point what Rajiv made is, is, the, is the importance of a regulator. So um, uh, while the, the, the farm laws by itself on a standalone basis have got a lot of positive um, uh, aspects, one aspect which is coming out very clearly is, um, there are two aspects. Um, uh, one is the absence of the, the regulation, uh, war site in the, in, the, in the trade area. The second, of course, uh, is the uh, many commentators have passed on is the entire dispute resolution system where uh, uh, there's no recourse to the um, uh, farmers, to the civil court, as well as the, uh, the role of the SDM. 
So those are the two issues. I think um, uh, government of India is, is cognizant of these two issues. Uh, at some stage, uh, as they uh, start reviewing the, uh, these uh, things, uh, actions would happen on those uh, aspects as well. So with this, uh, I think uh, we are concluding this um, uh, section. I think we are on time. Um, uh, Vivekanandan is my, is my timekeeper. He says we are almost on time. We are supposed to complete it by 12.05. We are completing it by uh, 12.10. So next session uh, is an uh, important session where I would like to pose um, a couple of questions to this esteemed pa panelist to elicit some of the responses which, um, um, which, uh, which can go into some of the deeper questions which we have. The first question which I want to pose is to Ashish as well as to Madhu. Um, uh, in terms of building the economies of scale, uh, uh, what are the opportunities and challenges for the FPOs? in terms of um, uh, integrating the small order farmers in the FPO, uh, their opportunity and the challenges. Probably Ashish can start, then uh, Madhu can come in. Go to Ashish. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, economies of scale uh, for the FPOs will come that, you know, uh, how good our uh, promoting institutions are. I mean, if we are talking about, you know, that, the, the more number of farmers are joining the FPO movement, the first challenge is that we build good FPO, which are uh, institutionally strong, and they have uh, a strong production system. And to, to make that um, happen, you need to have a good promoting institutions. Uh, this government of India's guidelines are talking about CBBO, the, the uh, cluster-based uh, business organizations for the FPOs. They are supposed to be the one hand, they are the promoting institutions. And the, on the other hand, they are also supposed to be the kind of business incubation uh, institution. So I, I, I would actually imagine that this, some of these CBBOs eventually become a joint stock company and this is a good thing that you know government of india has done they have allowed the private companies to become even the even the cbbo so all those restrictions earlier restrictions that if you are not an ngo you cannot participate in this kind of work so that thing has gone now so the cbbos probably can you know uh, become the joint stock company over a period of time and that is and they create a kind of a robustness in the model and then you, you attract more and more number of farmers. Look, at the end of the day, for a farmer to join the APO movement is that whether he or she is getting and that delta amount in terms of, in terms of that, you know, when he sells things to the APO or when he buys things uh, from them, he, would, he is continuously uh, comparing APO with the other service providers. So FPO, I mean, if, if you ask me what farmers are looking for, they are looking for two things when they sell things to the FPO. They price a stable price, right? And two, that immediate, immediate payment. These are the two things that they're looking for. If FPOs can live up to that expectations, then, then they're the, they're the winner. And to make that happen, the APOs need to be supported, APOs need to be coordinated, APOs need to be placed properly in the supply chain for their due, you know, kind of the place that they, they uh, are supposed to be. I see that there is a tough competition at the moment in the commodity market, commodity selling market. The APOs greatest advantage is that they are the, the, the owner of the production system. So if the middle class is asking or the growing market is asking for quality food, no other supply chain actors can maneuver the production system except the FPOs. We need to create more and more quality market. You know, I mean, we can, uh, we can uh, talk about, uh, you know, this uh, general meal quality ATA uh, for milk quality data and the package data sold at uh, uh, 25 rupees a kilo. And we can also talk about uh, chemical uh, 
pesticide free or, or or those kind of stuff at 35 rupees kilo if it is a 35 rupees kilo material or the stuff is actually growing in the market segment then apus have a better future because they can control that production system no one no one else can do i'm i'm very hopeful that with the indian middle class uh, growing and their income is growing and their their expenditure on food is uh, still very low and uh, once they start demanding uh, a better quality food the apus have a better better uh, you know kind of a market prospect uh, yeah so 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 you know i mean uh, these these are the challenges but uh, apus have a have a great future yeah that i can i can uh, foresee thank you ashish uh, over to madhu ji yeah thanks uh, mani um so yeah i mean i do think that uh, with this relaxation in markets uh, it does uh, open up the space uh, considerably and i i talk from my experience of uh, you know pradhan has promoted this poultry cooperatives and the poultry cooperatives also used to you know spend considerable Uh, efforts and energies into promoting maize cultivation in their service area villages now and you know they would procure directly from the farmers also and all this this would but you know all these transactions would be subject to still the mandi tax uh, regime even though you know i mean mm, the mandi uh, having contributed anything to this entire process so definitely a, ve- a, a, a welcome uh, a step uh i completely agree with the you know the challenges that the, the that uh, uh, ashish uh, spoke about um uh, so fpos i mean that the, there are i mean so i was in another listening to a webinar yesterday and you know there also i mean this issue of, that basically there are three big uh you know areas for fpos uh, constraints or whatever you may call it one is market the other is financing and the third is technology these uh, three are you know really areas of uh, where a lot more work uh, with the uh, fpos would be required and of course the need for um, you know also um, uh a uh, uh, supporting uh, fpos uh, to become uh, competitive so that they can uh, sustain uh, beyond the uh, project period uh, so typically we 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 see that as long as a project lasts the fpos also last and then there's a you know rapid decline we don't want to see uh, that phenomena uh, happening uh i also you know uh, don't really see um, you know many i mean uh, we see we hear of this fear that you know big corporate players and rushing in i don't really see big players uh, rushing in with huge investments uh, to set up shop because the volumes i don't think i mean my sense is and what i hear is the volumes uh, don't just match up except in you know existing the large uh, clusters uh so uh, uh yeah so who's going to you know uh, uh play the i mean the put in the in- investments for the intermediate uh, term the other thing is that uh, you know the apmcs uh, also the a- a- apmcs as a as a as a mandi space diluting because of this and i don't uh, see that also because you know the apmcs were set up quite some time ago and these spaces are now functioning at depreciated costs so any new investment to be made by a corporate would result in you know much higher per unit cost of transaction or per unit load of transaction so that's also another factor you know i mean so who's going to actually you know uh, uh, is the is the corporate uh, uh, going to wait for public uh, uh, investments to be uh, made available etc all those are you know open uh, questions still and also i mean there's a catch 22 phenomena also especially for the areas which are not you know very high volume production clusters is the buyer going to come in first or is the you know uh, uh, and then the production picks up as a response as a cue to that or whether the production picks up first and then so we don't see i mean um, 
you know, even now the um, uh, the bigger corporates uh, having a direct presence in the primary uh, market. So it does, you know, create a, a ground for smaller actors, uh, you know, to play this intermediation role. It could be played either by the FPOs or by the, you know, ubiquitous uh, uh, traders. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, definitely, I mean, uh, uh, with these kinds of uh, enabling ecosystem for uh, FPOs and the areas of, you know, particularly financing, uh, but also, you know, markets and technologies. I mean, uh, with this support uh, being provided, it does, I mean, uh, all these together, I mean, augur, uh, augur well for the possibilities. Now, whether it actually, you know, the space, uh, does get plugged we'll, we'll we'll have to you know watch uh, watch this and come back uh, again to you know with with more uh, concrete uh, developments. developments yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you really uh, appreciate the views of both uh, ashish and madhu in terms of what are the opportunities and challenges um, uh, like in any cases when the new um, uh, changes comes in you have both opportunity and challenges what I see is there, there are quite a few areas where the, um, uh, the both the private sector as well as the, the uh, NGO sector and the government will have to work together to build the capacity of the FPOs to ensure that they are able to access the market much better. Right? So um, we have um, uh, another four minutes for the session to be completed. Let me uh, take one more question to the um, panelist. Um, and um, the question is, what are the emerging opportunities for the MSME and the um, uh, agri startups to collaborate with FPOs in, in, in the wake of the agri marketing reforms? Uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Ra Ra Rajiv Kaiman, then uh, Mr. Sinha can take it over. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mani. So uh, the opportunities for MSMEs or agri business to work with FPOs is, is huge, actually, you know, especially after the reforms coming in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, as someone who's interacted with farmer producer organizations across the country, as far as Northeast, earlier there were challenges. Uh, it was not easy to kind of, you know, do transactions with the FPOs in other states. But now with the with the reforms, with the market getting open up, it becomes much more easier for me to, let's say, procure maize from, uh, you know, UP or let's say, you know, apple from, from, from Himachal Pradesh. Now, if you look at it, you know, so there are around 7,300 odd registered FPCs across the country, most of them being supported by NABAT and SFAC. Uh, but the sad, uh, the sad fact is that, you know, most of these uh, farmer producer companies are not profitable, right? And, and one of the primary reasons for this is the challenge that they are facing with regard to the market linkage part. Right. See, unless and until the market linkage activity is taken care, it becomes very difficult for the farmer producer organization to function like a business entity. And, and that's what, you know, the government is hoping it to kind of do. So even while we interacted with these FPCs, everyone in Unison said, you know, the major challenge what we are facing is market linkage. And the, the next uh, biggest challenge being the, the access to finance part. Right. So I think with these reforms being opened up, with more MSMEs and agri business willing to do, uh, you know, business with FPOs, it becomes much more easier for at least some of these FPCs to kind of climb up the ladder. Now, again, market linkage, as I mentioned, is one of the, uh, you know, the linkage challenge, uh, you know, what they are facing. But apart from that, you know, there are also other uh, linkages issue like input linkage, you know, access to finance, and of course, as 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 Madhu uh, mentioned, you know, uh, technology linkage is a big challenge, right? And these are areas, again, uh, startup like us and other emerging startups, and even some of the, uh, you know, the MSMEs and agri business, uh, 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 you know, companies would be able to kind of play a very pivotal role. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, over to Mr. Sinha. So you're on mute. Rajiv. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as, as eminent panelists have pointed out, reach becomes easy. Now you can go anywhere and buy from anywhere, okay? Along with reach, and then there is this lure that I can buy and resell. So coming back to the previous point I made, uh, are, you an, are you a trader trading through electronic means? Now, whatever you call yourself, once you buy and resell, you are as good as a trader, okay? Or a manufacturing entity. So the... Opportunity is a wider reach across the country. 
apps, electronic means, electronic catalogs makes life much easier to reach anywhere you want. You have enabling entities and at very, very competitive cost in the beginning to really uh, for you to start. The challenge, challenge is to expect that I would be able to take the entire principal risk for that. It has been proven many times in past, including we had FPO Federation experience. Uh, when we had done this FPO procurement, uh, people started believing that, you know, we could also be, you know, a big trading entity. So many FPOs and many companies, federations, bought on their own behalf in the prospect to sell in the future. This should be strictly avoided, I would say. Trading is an expert job. Entities like Cargill, ADM and the best of the worlds, they do not operate more than 1% gross profit with all the brands and global movement and all that. So this lure need to be, you know, registered the way Pradhan has really promoted that poultry cooperatives, uh, poultry institutions that uh, FPOs in uh, MP is a matter of years of work. And at opportune time, things started getting together. As Madhu rightly pointed out, you don't need to run a maize production program. Once you are a buyer yourself, people start growing it around you. So first opportunity, as I said, reach is there. Challenge is the lure. We should not be, you know, we NCDX linked farmers, uh, FPOs for hedging. Many of them started speculating, believing that in upward commodity cycle you gain, but if prices go down, the entire money gets wasted. So strict to the role that you have. Second piece, based on the experience that we had, the current market reforms gives enough opportunity for each one of us to do what we do in a better manner, I would say, do our best in our core areas. It also gives you opportunity to go beyond that, but think 10 times before that, FTCs are a farmer aggregate based at a production center. They are best suited to collect, produce best. Just focus there. Don't try to make them jack of all trades. End of the day, the person who have all the ability, let's take a FPO, where the FPO CEO, so to say, has developed all the capabilities, the market would pay him, pay him or her 10 times. And the person will be out. So leadership and all, there are other issues that we have not touched upon, but those are again real issues. So allow them to work and other uh, initiatives that Mani rightly pointed out. Now, MSMEs or any startups, they want to go for meaningful combinations with a fair expectations of risk reward, price setting and all. So I think the, while sky is the limit, at the same time, higher you go, the third would be higher when you fall. So just, yeah. Thank you, That's Rajesh. about it, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, always in succeed point. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So uh, Vivekanandan, we are scheduled to complete it by 12.25. I think it is 12.28 now. We are over by three minutes. Um, what is the process? Do we have the time uh, to uh, another couple of minutes? Or what? Sure. Uh sure uh, mani Vannanji. i would request the uh, technology moderator to extend the session by another 10 minutes yes it is already done okay thanks thanks a lot mani ji you the session is extended thank by you. another 10 minutes thank you thank you so um, uh, before we sum up the session i have one um, question to the panelists uh, and we i think we'll have only one question to the panelists which i want to post to the team uh, to the panel uh, and then we can do a quick summation then uh, we can close the session so the, uh, the question is, uh, in the absence of the uh, oversight, the regulation part, which came in um, uh, multiple times, uh, we don't have regulation in the trade area at all. Um, what are the ways and means by which we can create a level playing field uh, uh, to the uh, FPOs? When um, I, um, I leave it open to the team, uh, probably since uh, Rajiv raised this point uh, first up, Maybe we start with uh, Rajiv, then we can go to the other term, other panelists uh, to get their uh, opinion. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mani. I think it's a very, uh, very valid question what you have raised. Um, I would say it's purely, uh, you know, up to the the particular institution to kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, take the right decision and ensure, uh, you know, fairness and transparency in the transaction what they do. 
and agri being a sector uh, uh, you know a critical sector uh, you know for a country like india i think uh, uh, institution like ours which is an impact organization needless to say we would not get into any transaction which compromises the interest of the farmer right so that is something which we are very conscious about it i think any impact startup from that perspective we don't have to worry about but i think the fear is more from the other uh, private sector institutions and big corporates in terms of you know since they are purely driven by the commercial interest how do they behave right uh, so that's where maybe a third party or a third person acting as a regulator might play a vital role but till such time i think it's up to the uh, institution to kind of be cognizant of the factor that you know the, the people that we are dealing with are small and marginal farmers right and they need that hand holding with support which is very critical for the economy yeah thank you rajiv uh, what to uh, rajesh uh, you have got a bit of experience in this particular uh, area i would uh, say you know the yeah, only thing i would say is uh, we are seeing a redefinition of the roles and responsibilities okay in that context when you want to go outside ask as many questions as possible and don't have that hello by now we should all know with the current uh, information no longer being of the same premium at it used to be in past going to the great uh, telecom revolution we are having so ask as many questions as possible whoever has come to you find out what is the core area and what is the desire the desire and who he or she is may not be enough for you to get into a transaction uh, there are examples but i think buyer beware still remains the you be very very conscious about it enter into contract only when you are successful uh, when you feel that you are confident now what we have found that and i used to work in ngos in mewat area near gurgaon and what i found that every year irrespective of all the warnings you gave these villagers will get some good quality plants because they are near to delhi gurgaon and the guy will take away he will give initially free for 10 rupees 100 rupees then give for 500 rupees and still not charge then take 2000 rupees advance and then they vanish trust is a very very costly piece don't trust people just by name or face be very careful be very conscious of your own core opportunities galore lures are galore and the last piece the messenger becomes the message at times so what happens rather than serving the true interest of fpos each one of us is serving our own true interest that's true for myself okay so and i believe that that's how most of us are there at any point in time you see that your interests are now becoming secondary to the interest of the person who is serving you ruthlessly withdraw markets are ruthless they don't care whether you are a fto or a corporate or whosoever you are markets are ruthless remember this message and take quick pertinent decisions that protect your interests that's about thank it. you rajesh thank you uh, ashish your thoughts on this one on regulation and creating a level playing field well i think uh, uh, my uh, view is that you know i do not i don't like any regulation as such i know i mean uh, any regulation if there is there has to be any regulation that should be to protect the farmers interest not to to protect the interest of apo because that is a business entity but what i want a government to do for a level playing field a that you know they should immediately uh, activate their banks to lend apos at a cheaper rate of interest because 14% 15% working capital loan is simple through the nbfcs it is not it is not making any sense you know i mean apos are making a lot of effort to aggregate and sell but you know they are becoming uncompetitive with such paying such high rate of interest and and our and their competitors are sitting on uh, age old uh, kind of you know free money which is basically without any interest and it's very difficult to compete with them uh and who are their competitors basically the 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 state in the in the locality who is basically you know aggregating so so i think that is the first thing that i want them to do secondly i i was i mean like you know what when rajesh said that today morning the 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 onion price ha, has crashed to like 20 rupees a kilo or something like that i i am bit just disappointed i mean this is where and it is this has happened because you know government started imp, ex, importing onion i don't like this if you if you you know uh, this you know 
there's no stock limit here. That is very good. Then why are you playing with this this you know this uh, export uh, import business? Let let farmers to earn money. You know what is what is big deal? I mean, if 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 everybody is buying onion at eighty rupees kilo and you know I mean uh, jello with it for a, for a while, I mean you know let the so this is the, the government should not unnecessarily interfere when farmers are earning money, right? So these are some of these things I would like government to to uh, to do so that there is a level playing playing. And of course, I have talked about a support system. Mani, could I just do a quick rejoinder? Just one quick rejoinder. Sure. So. Yeah. Uh, one, as we talked about, the um, uh, Ashish put it right, was first that the interest at which FPO will get finance is important. That should be the objective, not that you do a refinance. So what happens, large institution do refinance to way A does a, averages it out at, at it was, as it was happening. So in FPO, when they have said they will get concessional finance, it's a welcome step. So that's a good step. Second. Infrastructure has to be treated as infrastructure. So infrastructure as villages, again, I think Pradhan has done a wonderful job to create practical infrastructure. However, when now India is one state, the scale of infrastructure will have to be extremely high. So regulations around that, uh, more power to WDRA or to area regulator, because today that regulator does not have a power to penalize the defaulters. So ENWRs, though a great entity, a instrument, is not very popular. So either you empower the regulator or you merge it into a regulator which is far more powerful. Comparison would be SEBI before 1991, 92, and SEBI today. So that's the kind. Third, maybe National Agri Development Board or something. You need to have one somebody other than SDOs to regulate. Amul remains. Amul it will continue to do. Now NDDB, do we want a board or something? A lot of, there are more uh, mature and wise people than me who can, you know, advise on it. So I won't put an advice, but definitely some kind of a framework. See, we are SROs. The boom bus cycle right now, as I'm talking, I have known NGOs, intervening entities who have actually bought and now they are, because government job is not to protect per se farmer or consumer. There is no act to give MSP. It's a desire and a, socialist kind of objective that governments project. So they also know that poorest of the poor, when we say we have 40%, 50% of the people who cannot, who are on our food support system, they also need to be protected. So yeah. again, reiterating the point of don't take the principal risk. Now you bought onion at 60 rupees a kg, hoping it will continue for another month. 65 was the rumor going on. Now it's down to 20, 30 rupees. You have lost your shirt. Sure, sure. So stick so to the rules, and that's what I'm about concentration of risk. Yeah. Yeah. So Rajesh, so sorry, we are exceeding our time limit. Um, uh, th thanks for those uh, very uh, helpful comments. Let me quickly more go, go to Madhu for a uh, brief comments if you have. No, uh, uh, Mani, no new points to uh, add. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madhu. Thank you. So um, I think um, we don't, literally we don't have time. We have already exceeded our uh, time limit. Let me quickly sum, sum it up the, the, these uh, three important questions which are for, for, uh, posed to the panelists. And um, um, their response uh, will be consolidated as part of this particular deliberation and, um, uh, and will be shared with the, uh, with the team. Um, one um, okay, key takeaway for me is while it is good to have a consumer bias in the, on all our policy, it's also how to ensure that there is a farmer uh, constituency which, which is there, ensure that the policies are also not affecting the farmer's uh, income as we go ahead. That's one of the key takeaways for me uh, in this uh, discussion. Uh, I'll stop here. Um, let me uh, thank all the panelists for their um, sharing their um, uh, knowledge, experiences, and their thoughts on what, how do we kind of improve the marketing um, system in the country. Now, with that, let me hand it over to Vivekanandan. Over to you, Vivekanandan. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Manivanan. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure uh, listening to all the distinguished speakers' views and uh, ably moderated by uh, Manivanan ji. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of the session. We once again thank all the uh, speakers and the moderator for agreeing to come on board and we are thankful and grateful for that. Uh, thanks a lot. With this, we will close the session. Thanks a lot, everyone.